Hi, welcome to Far From Eden. Happy Saturday. Uh, it's good to see you guys. I have been told by several of you, first of all, you tell me to read so many different books. And I, I know, I know, I've got a whole, I've got a list. But this book, The Manipulated Man, that's been, that's been suggested to me several times. So when I saw Manosphere highlights daily, I hope I got the plural right on all those words. When I saw his latest video, I thought, oh, it kind of feels like cheating because I haven't read the book, but I want to see the video that he's put together about the claim he's making is that the book, The Manipulated Man, was right, and it's evident 50 years later. So I'm excited to watch this video with you guys and get an education about um, what it is she wrote about, what uh, Man of Spear highlights daily, what his take on it is. I'm just, I'm excited. I'm excited to be, for things to be mansplained to me. <laughs> and literally, yes, I, I have no problem with mansplain it to me, you know? The best, the best description of that is, I think when you, when you watch like a whole math video, he will explain in only, in the way only a man can. <laughs> anyway, I'm excited to see this video with you guys. Um, I have to remember I'm watching it with you guys and not just by myself. So I'm like, uh, hopefully I have, you know, valuable things to add. We will soon see. So let's see, I have no idea what this is gonna be about. I mean, what it's gonna be about. It's exciting, okay. Etwas ausgefallene Meinung über eine emanzipierte Frau. Nach meiner Meinung sind es nicht die Frauen, die sich befreien müssen, sondern vor allen Dingen die Männer. Ich denke, dass diese ganzen Aufrufe zur Befreiung der Frau, wie sie momentan so sehr in Mode sind, dass sie nichts weiter sind als Erbauungsliteratur. Ich nenne sie deshalb Erbauungsliteratur, weil sie sowohl den Männern als auch den Frauen genau das sagen, was sie am liebsten hören. Nämlich den Frauen sagen sie, dass sie ja so arm sind und so unterdrückt. Und das gibt den Frauen eine fantastische Ausrede, aus dem System Ehe noch mehr herauszuholen, als sie sowieso schon tun. Und den Männern äh, sag, äh, sagt man, dass sie Tyrannen seien. Und die Männer hören das gern, sie halten das für, für ein Kompliment, sie finden das besonders männlich. Nach meiner Meinung verhält es sich aber im Großen und Ganzen doch ganz, ganz anders. Nach meiner Meinung werden die Männer einfach von den Frauen hemmungslos ausgebeutet. Sie werden zum Geldverdienen interessiert. Und From her lips to God's ears. Gosh, and that was 50 years ago. So probably 74. I've read The Manipulated Man, Esther Villar's provocative work that sent shockwaves through the effinist and intellectual communities of the 1970s. Imagine the scene. It's 1971, and a young woman boldly claims that the true power dynamics in society are entirely different from what everyone believes. Villar's assertions that women, not men, hold the upper hand in societal manipulation caused an uproar, sparking heated debates and fierce backlash. Und Drohungen, worauf beziehen sich die? Auch auf alles, auf alles, auf dass man meine Bücher verbrennen sollte oder vernichten oder auch ganz persönlich, ja, dass man mich umbringt. Mord Morddrohungen, ja, das ist, bekomme ich also jeden Monat mindestens eine, immer noch. Now, fast forward 50 years. How have Villar's claims held up against the relentless march of time and social progress? Have we truly shifted the paradigms she controversially challenged or do echoes of her arguments still resonate today? In this presentation, we will explore the seismic shifts and enduring constants in gender dynamics since Villar's era. We'll dive into the evolution of societal roles, scrutinize the remnants of Villar's assertions, and reflect on what these changes tell us about the journey toward genuine equality. In particular, we'll be focusing on the first three chapters of Villar's book, The Slave's Happiness. What is a man? What is a woman? This is part one of our video presentation, where we contrast the radical perspectives of the past with the nuanced realities of the present. 
uncovering what has changed, what has remained steadfast, and what it all means for the future of gender relations. So buckle up for this dive into time, controversy, and the relentless quest for truth, one that is sure to be thought-provoking. Let's talk about it. I'm so excited that MHD made this video and now it's, it's gonna be a series. This is wonderful. It's great to react to all the shenanigans that the, the women are up to on TikTok and the things they're saying. That's important. We need to see what's going on out there and call it out for what it is. But this is so important too, Esther Vilar. Uh, it's interesting to me that she <laughs> was talking about, you know, the violence you know, the, the violent threats against her, because how can that be? How can that possibly be? I thought that, you know, women were more gentle and feminists just want equality and women, women should have all the options. And yet this woman, whatever she was saying was so threatening. It tells you a lot about what the movement is. And not only that its intention is to destroy men, disenfranchisement and break up the family, but boy, they really don't want, it, it isn't for women. It isn't for women. So let's get into it. Now it's time for us to get into this and do what we gotta do. Because we men ain't we. We men ain't we. Women let men work for them, think for them, and take on their responsibilities. In fact, they exploit them. Yet, since men are strong, intelligent, and imaginative, while women are weak, unimaginative, and stupid, why isn't it men who exploit women? Reading this chapter reminded me of this quote. The best way to keep a prisoner from escaping is to make sure he never knows he's in prison. Esther Villar suggests that qualities often associated with leadership and power, such as strength, intelligence, and imagination, might actually make individuals more susceptible to exploitation. Instead of leading to genuine power, these traits could trap individuals into roles of service and hard work, essentially making them slaves to societal expectations and responsibilities. Esther Villar provocatively proposes that those who rule the world are not necessarily the most capable or expert individuals. Instead, she argues that power may reside with those who are not particularly skilled or fit for significant achievements. In her controversial view, women. Desperate times call for desperate measures. Yes. <laughs> the old damsel in distress trick works every time. Need some help? Why should a woman learn to change a flat when the opposite sex, half the world's population, is able and willing to do it for her? Esther Villar uses the damsel in distress argument to explain how women manipulate men into doing their bidding. She claims that women, while appearing less involved in the heavy lifting, are the true rulers. Esther Villar's view is that women exercise power through indirect means, leveraging societal structures and relationships to control men and benefit from their labor. Okay, I'm gonna, I hope you're in the chat tonight. Uh, Glenn Cross blog, Glenn Crossing, I don't know which uh, handle you'll have in the chat tonight. Hope you're there because is this the traditionalism you're talking about when you say, because I know sometimes we're at cross purposes in the chat and some people say we need to get back to traditionalism and what they mean is the woman bringing value the woman actually doing things working in the home taking care of the kids raising a garden having chickens goats whatever keeping the house clean tending to her husband all the things right and you're like oh gosh i'm don't i'm gonna try not to watch it and you'll say well tradition is actually bad that's actually feminism this is what you're talking about right how women were, you know, damsel in distress. And this is the chivalry thing that is actually men just being slave, slaves and deferring to women all the time. It isn't that actual, a woman is a woman and she does her role and, you know, works in her role and the man works in his role and they're complementary. And I think this is what you're talking about. I just thought of it right now. I thought this is a really good 
example to to make it kind of clear to people that when some people say traditionalism, they they hearken back to the days of chivalry where men would kind of sacrifice for women and there really wasn't anything going the other way. And it seems like this. So anyway, I uh, I'm ex now I'm super excited about tonight's uh, tonight's premiere. One example that illustrates Vilar's argument can be found in reality TV, Expedition Ramazan, a show that places a group of strangers in an isolated location where they must provide food, fire, and shelter for themselves, offers a clear demonstration. In one episode, a man from the men's camp had to serve in the women's camp and was immediately put to work on tasks they should have done themselves. Zeg, ik heb hier een leuk lijstje. Vissen. En dan moet vuren maken. En uh, hout hakken, uiteraard. Want ja, fysiek zijn wij toch uh, in de minderheid. Hè? Wij doen echt alleen het hoognodige en wat niet nodig is. Nou, hoeft, ik heb al hout gehakt hoor. Jawel, ja, ja, nee, maar, ja, uh, jawel, jawel, maar ik bedoel, snijden. we hebben niet berg nee, en voorraad. Ja, maar wat wij ook heel graag van je willen, dat is gewoon een goed gesprek en de moreel een mm. beetje ophogen hier. Dat, want dat, dat in contrast, when a woman from the women's camp had to serve in the men's camp, observe the difference. Ik dacht echt dat ik op een droomeiland terecht kwam. Zo'n mooie hut, slaapplaatsjes, een eettafel. Echt zo precies een cafeetje op het strand. Ik dacht echt van, ah, oh, nu nog een lekkere cocktail. En dat is hier. Oh my gosh. Oh. Exactly. This men build the world. And we women like that. We like the world that you you guys build. So like, oh my gosh, we are so dumb. Oh, we're so dumb. I'm in heaven. <laughs> Later in that episode, the males have to build the women out and the camps merge into a mixed group of men and women. Observe the dynamics at what used to be the women's camp. The mannen van Kamp Zuid zijn druk bezig het eilanden wat leefbaarder te maken. De vrouwen kijken goedkeurend toe. The women stand by, looking on approvingly. Just who benefits the most from this situation? Who is exploited here? Even if the women wanted to help, they would likely prove incompetent. Well, I have to say, these women did not grow up on a farm. <laughs> because you're not going to just sit there and you're going to you're going to be productive. You're not probably you're not going to be as productive as the men, but you're going to help. You know, you're going to be doing something. You're not going to just be standing there like that. Oh, my God, they should be so embarrassed. I feel like I'm saying that all the time, no matter what we're watching or watching some chick on TikTok are watching these people stand there. Look at her face. Look at her face. Look at that the face of a tyrant. That is the face of a tyrant right there. Look at her face. You can tell. Maybe I'm just crazy, but you can tell when you watch a woman for about, I don't know, a few minutes, you can tell what the face is that she makes most often. And that this is that woman's face. You know, that's what she does. Oh my God, they should be so embarrassed. Oh my gosh, by the way, the um, the conclusion to the uh, men versus women on the Survivor or whatever we were watching um, before, I just haven't figured out if I'm putting it on the members only on this channel or if I'm gonna put it on locals. You guys tell me, you guys tell me what, what which one you think. I need to do something for the YouTube members just because we have them, so. I've got a couple ideas. Anyway, look at this face. Oh my God. And they're there doing it because you know why? Because they're like, it's got to get done. And we don't want to live here like this. Then, as the task the men are undertaking require a level of skill and effort that they lack. You have just witnessed the foundation of the patriarchal system that women voluntarily chose to follow. It's only expected that men risk their lives to protect these women from danger. None of these women would prefer to be stuck on this island with a bear 
rather than with a man. This episode illustrates why effinists emerge when the world is built and safe, claiming oppression by men without considering that the world didn't start out with skyscrapers and air conditioning systems. The new generation suffer from amnesia. See how humbling this experience is for the women. Ik heb ooit een keer een interview gedaan met een social bioloog en die zei als het aan de vrouw had gelegen, dan leefden we nog in het stenen tijdperk. Ik begin er steeds meer in te geloven. Dat moet je niet zeggen. Nee. Nee. Dat is toch waar? Hoe kijk ik nu? Nee. Ja, er zijn echt een stelletje slonzen bij elkaar geweest. Nou, dat wil ik dus zelf toch niet uh, laten nee, zeggen ik hoor. Ook niet. Ja, maar het is wel zo. I will let myself say that, but it's true. Ja, yeah. that pretty much sums it up, doesn't it? They know, uh, they, they know more than what they're letting on. Not just these women, women in general. They just cannot be wrong. This is also, helaas, sorry. This is pure gold. The purest of the purest gold there is. Only the environment can humble women like this. Exactly. One of the ladies tries to maintain the delusion but due to the environmental circumstances, the other women refuse to follow her lead. Pure gold. Because they won't survive with that attitude. So these modern women immediately become damsels in distress and let the men do their bidding. This is exactly what will happen if society collapses. Even though these men are also modern, their instincts kick in and show these women who the real prize is. Let me add this. The men's instincts are to do this, to build, to do, you know, to shelter, you know, to make fire that's going to cook the food, that's going to stave off the elements. That's their instinct. The women immediately do damsel in distress. They're probably also doing more sort of hair grooming and feminine things. We could go out on a limb and say that is the female instinct. The female instinct is to attract one of these men to join up with and cooperate with. The problem is these women, they've got the instinct part right, that they kind of, you know, need to be more feminine and figure it out. And it comes in, it turns out as the damsel in distress routine. It's so funny to me because their instinct is telling them we need these we need these guys he's right manosphere daily is right like if society collapses and nature is what we have to contend with not all this industrialization and this fake world that's just been built and created by men and maintained by them if for whatever reason you know there's no more water service, electric, sewer, like all of that. Even government services, the dollar, you know, collapses. All of these things are, or war, like actual danger from war. Um, a lack in services like the police department, fire department. When, when all of those sort of fake, like man-made institutions that insulate women and, you know, give them that provision and protection, at least the idea of it that they rely on, if that goes away and they are, they are forced to contend with nature, there won't be any question if they're going to get on board and cooperate. They're, they're not going to be in any scenario where they have any other choice. Their lives will depend on it. I know it'll be so weird because a lot of you guys are going to be like, no, there's no amount of convincing. And that's fair. That's fair. You can't trust them. And I wouldn't trust them either. And with everything that, that, you know, all the life experience that women have had, if we were to have some kind of catastrophe that, you know, made them have to contend with nature, they would you don't know how hardened they are, how much if it would be fake and if everything were to just reboot, would they just be like, thanks for that, bye. 
probably a lot of them because they just don't have the ability to really submit for for life there's no more nobody's ride or die anymore be many me why do women not make use of their intellectual potential for the simple reason that they do not need to it is not essential for their survival theoretically it is possible for a beautiful woman to have less intelligence than a chimpanzee mm. and still be considered an acceptable member of society. Fast forward 50 years, oh society and technology have advanced to a point where traditional gender roles are less pronounced and men are no longer directly necessary for many, 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 many tasks that women once relied on them for. With just a few taps on her smartphone, a woman can summon roadside assistance or order services she needs. Birth control has given women unprecedented control over their reproductive health, allowing them to engage in sexual activity without the risk of unwanted pregnancy. The transition from the industrial era to the digital age has created numerous job opportunities that are less physically demanding, enabling women to pursue careers and achieve financial independence. This autonomy allows women to afford services and support that in the past would have been provided by their husbands, further reshaping the dynamics of power and dependence in modern relationships. Despite all these advances, Many, 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 many women will still expect men to adhere to traditional gender roles. In stark contrast, men have always been and... No man should get on his knee for a woman. The idea that a man would get down on one knee to propose, that just sets it all up. It, it just sets it up. That's not, that's not the way it is. It's backwards. And I think that is another sort of traditional chivalrous thing that was feminist before anyone had uttered the term feminism. You just, you just, you shouldn't get on your knee for a woman. You know, it's just not the way, it's not, not the way. The church, the Christian church has just messed it up so much about Christ, you know, serves the woman the way he served the church sacrificially. Yeah, but it's not like that. Christ was always the leader. It was always his way, you know. He didn't bow down to it. He didn't bow down to the people. That that wasn't it at all. They bowed down to him. And he led them and he saved them, but they just completely mess up like uh the dynamics and who who serves who and who submits to whom. It's messed up. I can't I can't go to church anymore. It's just all it's all just government propaganda continue to be judged primarily by their productivity and ability to provide a man's worth in society is often linked to his job his ability to earn and his contributions if a man is not productive he is not seen as an acceptable or valuable member of society this brings us to the next chapter what is a man A man is a human being who works. By working, he supports himself, his wife, and his wife's children. A woman, on the other hand, is a human being who does not work, or at least only temporarily. Most of her life, she supports neither herself nor her children, let alone her husband. Esther Villar dissects the societal constructs that define a man's value and identity, ultimately framing men as both indispensable and exploited within the traditional gender paradigm. A man's worth is measured by his competence and ability to provide. Villar suggests that women view men primarily through the lens of utility. Masculine qualities are those that serve women's needs, whether it's financial support, protection, or physical labor. Men are valued for what they can do rather than who they are. Human doing you are, human being you are not. That and that's a problem because what women need to realize and remember is that men are made in the image of God. You need to look at them like that. They are not utilities. They are people who are made in the image of God. They have huge capacities to love. They're, they're, 
their empathy is great. Have you ever seen when, you know, there's a, there's a little animal in distress, how many men are there trying to rescue it and try, this is what they do. Why do you think the damsel in distress routine worked for so long? Because men care. They actually care. Anyways, could go. Woo. Calm down. That's why the more a woman has, the more she will expect a man to provide. And in current times, women will speak the truth about how they feel their worth is based on their ability to secure a man who can offer even more than they already possess. The more utility she can provide for herself, the higher her expectations become for what a man should bring to the table. There shouldn't be no reason why you can't say, I don't want to date a bus driver. You know why? You're a lawyer. You are you did your education. You've done your work. You've been on television. You're still on television. And you probably don't want that kind of man. And that's okay. If you're not helping me with 90% of the things I need help with, why? Why are you here? Because I'm like, <laughs> I, I can do it for myself. So then why are you here? I feel like I have done so much work on myself. I have built a beautiful life for myself. I'm happy with my life where I'm at, my job. I'm successful, I'm independent. I'm healthier than I've ever been. I take such good care of myself. Truly the only thing I'm missing in my life is someone to enjoy it with. And I'm so sick of waiting. Like, when is it going to be my turn? That's not how it works. This is not, okay, first of all, are you six years old? Uh, your turn. That's <laughs> not how it works. Like, I've been waiting. No, you haven't been waiting, ma'am. You have been doing all the things for yourself. Working on yourself, that's doing things for myself, making money, everything, everything, everything. My ego, my ego, my ego. And now... And, and you just said how independent you are. This is not something that a man wants to sign up for. You have just shown that you don't need him for anything except for maybe he's something else to acquire, some other uh, achievement. You know, this is what I would say. If you listen to that lady, that is what I would call a pre-hypergamous woman. Because a woman who thinks like that is going to be happy with you for a time, but it's not going to be enough for long. She has this whole, I'm going to get the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. You're just a rung in her ladder that she's going to say she's satisfied with for a bit, but that'll only be for a minute. And she's already, you know, coming off as spoiled just with the, how she's saying it. It's my turn. It's like, it's almost a temper tantrum. There's a temper tra tantrum waiting to happen. That woman, she is a temper tantrum waiting to happen. No, one can hardly assume men do all this for pleasure and without feeling a desire for change. They do it because they have been manipulated into doing it. Their whole life is nothing but a series of conditioned reflexes, a series of animal acts. A man who is no longer able to perform these acts whose earning capacity is lessened, is considered a failure. He stands to lose everything, wife, family, home, his whole purpose in life. All the things, in fact, which give him security. And that makes me very angry. It hits, it hits too close to home for me because what I have found with having multiple progressive multiple sclerosis is that it's not a problem for men. They're, they see beyond that. That's not something that's a deal breaker for them. Also, it's not a deal breaker if you're with someone and you are diagnosed as a woman and you're diagnosed with that or something else. The man is there because he's loyal and commitment means something to him. Sickness as in health means something to him. However, what I have seen in the support groups I can bring myself to attend, like online or what have you, men being left when they're diagnosed. The women do not stick around. 
the women, as soon as he's injured or sick or anything, it's like, oh, this one's defective. I need to like return him, get a new one. This is, it's, it so infuriates me. I, I understand evolutionarily, like the woman's thinking I have to survive and this one's, you know, this one's not going to protect us or what have you anymore. That's, first of all, that's not necessarily true at all. You're much safer with the one who's invested in you. And even if he's quadriplegic and he's laying, you know, flat on his back, this is what your family is supposed to be about. And his family is supposed to be about. You don't, you don't just ditch him, but they do. They do all the time, all the time. It, it is brutal and it's so wrong. <sighs> it's interesting to see how Esther Villar's words are playing out in current times. Men are shamed from every angle for not performing their so-called duties. Because men are useless. But fail to address that the societal changes have significantly impacted the dynamics between men and women. The traditional carrot and stick approach is no longer effective. When Esther Villar wrote The Manipulated Man, it was feasible to support a family on one income. But times have changed. Men are opting out of the workforce at unforeseen rates. For many, 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 it's not an issue of not being able to find a job. They have simply opted out altogether. The Bureau of Labor Statistics found that only 89% of working age men have a job or are actively looking for work. In 1950, that number was at 97%, while the early 1950s saw around 96% of working age men between the ages of 25 and 54 working full or part-time jobs. That proportion has now moved to just 86%, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Additionally, only half of single men are actively seeking relationships or even casual dates, according to Pew. This shift suggests that the traditional motivations for men, such as providing for a family and fulfilling societal roles, are losing their influence. As women become more self-sufficient and societal expectations evolve, the pressure on men to conform to these outdated roles is becoming increasingly unsustainable. The juice ain't worth the squeeze. Esther Villar's assertion that men are manipulated into their roles through societal conditioning is evident in how these roles are being rejected in modern times. Then on top of that, as if you're not trying to spend money, you have to. And everything's expensive. I own a painting company. I still can't make it. I'm trying, man. I can't look at my daughter and my wife and know I'm feeling. Men's traditional expectations discourage them from expressing emotions and instead emphasize the pursuit of success, power, and competition. Studies show that men who feel they cannot meet these traditional expectations often suffer from major psychological problems. All right, now to an alarming trend on the rise the in the construction industry. New research showing that construction workers are dying by at an alarming rate. While demand for construction workers continues to surge, the profession has one of the highest rates. That's according to data from the CDC. Fathers are expected to be strong, stoic breadwinners, and the difficulties they face are often invisible to others. Let's listen to what this man says in the following clip. Hey guys, I really appreciate everybody, um, you know, watching my video and, uh, you know, liking and following me and commenting and, you know, instant messaging me and telling me, you know, that I'm loved and that I'm not alone and we're all feeling the same way. And uh, I've had other people, you know, say things like, oh, you shouldn't be doing that. You're a man, you know, da, 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 whatever. I, I don't care about that stigma. What I care about is this and how your guys' heads are as well.
Men are conditioned by society to suppress their emotions because showing vulnerability is seen as a sign of weakness. This stigma is often perpetuated by women who need men to remain breadwinners, providers, regardless of their emotional state. I hope his wife doesn't see this video of him crying. And if he does, and let's say he starts crying, tears up, or really starts crying, she inevitably will have this reaction of, I don't feel safe when he doesn't open up to me because I don't feel connected to him, but I don't feel safe when he's that vulnerable with me either because there's something, just some cultural programming in her around what it's like to be with a man who's crying or a man who is vulnerable. I wish I could explain this right now. I wish this is somewhere where I don't, I don't understand it. I will tell you that I remember the first time I saw my dad cry and it wasn't like a lot. It was just barely. And it was the day my sister was uh, naturalized as a citizen of the U.S. And I remember I was young. I was, I don't know, seven, eight years old, something like that. And I was a little confused, like what's happening. And um, I was, it was a little scary because as I said in one of my videos yesterday, I always felt when I was with my dad, I was never afraid. I felt like he, anything that came up, he could handle it. He would figure it out, he could handle it. And even if he couldn't, didn't matter because he would just know the best thing to do. So I was never afraid when I was with him. When I saw him cry, it was scary, but my instinct was to make it better. You know, um, I just pretended like I didn't see because I kind of felt like that's what I should do. I, I, I didn't feel like it. I should be like, hey, dad, what's going on? And the other times it was few and far between, but the other times I'd seen him be upset, it was scary. It is scary because you think, well, this is someone who's supposed to have it all handled. But you understand that we're all human and that's not realistic and everybody needs somebody. And so you just, you think your instinct as a woman should kick in. Your instinct to empathize, to comfort, to reassure. So I don't, I'm trying to see how these women can just feel that instinct of being afraid when the man is crying or feeling weak. But how do they not say, okay, this is uncomfortable because, uh-oh. But how are they not aware to, and how, does, how do they not realize this is the time, this is my time, this is when I'm needed, you know? To, to soothe and comfort. I, I, I don't know. Maybe one of these ladies will see something, will say something, and I'll be like, oh, I can translate that. We'll see. But that's just my preface of what happens in a woman's mind when a man cries or shows emotional vulnerability. Despite women's increased earning power, Many, 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 many of them would still rather be single mothers than financially support a man. This aligns with Vila's concept of conditioned roles. No matter what a man's job may be, bookkeeper, doctor, bus driver, or managing director, every moment of his life will be spent as a cog in a huge and pitiless system, a system designed to exploit him to the utmost, to his dying day. So what is the role of, the, of a man? It's really unclear. By the age of 12 at the latest, most women have decided to become pro- Or, to put it another way, they have planned a future for themselves, which consists of choosing a man and letting him do all the work. In return for his support, they are prepared to let him make use of their vagina at certain given intervals. The minute a woman has made this decision, she ceases to develop her mind. She may, of course, go on to obtain various degrees and diplomas. Esther Villar does not pull any punches when it comes to describing women. The word stupid 
or its variants are repeated over and over again, triggering a lot of people, especially women. Frau Villa, ich habe also gestern sehr genau mir noch mal Ihre Bücher angeschaut und ich habe gesehen unter anderem darin, dass ich nach Ihrer Definition ein sogenanntes öffentliches Kind bin. Ja, das sind Sie. Richtig, das also, ich werde gleich noch den Zuschauerinnen und Zuschauern erklären, was es ist, wenn sie es nicht gelesen haben, äh, dessen wichtigste Berufslegitimation die Vagina ist. Ein öffentliches Kind ist nach ihrer Definition eine der Frauen, die also den Männern, die das alles erfunden haben, nachplappert. Frauen ging es ja so schlecht und sie müssten sich emanzipieren. Ja. Und äh, was wir da schreiben und sagen, das ist der größte Unsinn und wenn wir keine Frauen wären, dann können wir das alles gar nicht schreiben. Ich muss sagen, gelinde gesagt, ich fühle mich doch schlicht diffamiert von Ihnen. Ich könnte mir übrigens vorstellen, dass nach dem Gesetzbuch sowas, äh, dass es möglich ist, sowas strafrechtlich zu verfolgen. Ja, Sie können es versuchen. Könnte ich mir vorstellen. When Esther Villar wrote The Manipulated Man in 1971, the feminist and women's liberation movement were at a peak, advocating fiercely for gender equality and challenging traditional roles. These movements were highly vocal and influential, pushing for societal changes with bold and often uncompromising rhetoric. Yeah, it looks like Gloria Steinem right there, isn't it? That chick, I'm pointing at my screen like you guys can see, but that white chick there, uh, she looks like Gloria Steinem, I don't know. But uh, CIA agent, um, yeah, this, this was all during, so around the time she wrote this, was all um, right after abortion was legalized and uh, and uh, 1969 was the first no-fault divorce law um, passed by Ronald Reagan in the state of California. So all those things, it was the sexual revolution. We can't have, you know, the manipulated man and this Esther Vilar coming out telling everybody the truth. God, it's the same thing. This, I feel like I'm in some kind of a time warp. And that was like 50 years ago, and this is now, and I'm just over here agreeing with everything Esther Vilar, Vilar said. Wow. And we're still fighting these leftists. That's what they are. That's what they are. It's not anything pro-woman. It's never been pro-woman. In this context, Vilar's work can be seen as a counterpoint employing provocative language to critique and provoke discussion about these issues. I personally don't think women are stupid, but I believe women are more like children in adult bodies. Research shows that the male brain differs from the female brain. In adulthood, male brains are on average 10% to 15% larger than female brains, even after adjusting for body height. Studies indicate that some fundamental molecular pathways in the brain operate differently in males and females, and not just by a little. It's clear that men and women not only think differently, but are also triggered differently. You're not going to die. You are not going to die. It came right towards me like that. Yeah. Just here they are. That's the show that we're going to watch the conclusion of on either locals or uh, da, 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 YouTube membership. Yeah, here they are. This is the episode we watched where she's panicking. It's typical, right? And that's why I watch the, all those cop cam videos. Because I'm like, this is what they are. This is what we are. We're six-year-olds. You know? Ah, it is what it is. <laughs> I have a hairdresser and like I can't afford this. Oh my gosh. It's just so hard. And I'm not gonna leave this, so I've got this bit. I don't know how many days. <laughs> Women often cry when times get hard, and society generally accepts that it's okay for women to cry. Yeah. However, it goes deeper than that. According to research, women's stress levels are 50 percent higher than men's mm -hmm. women and girls are twice as likely to experience depression compared to men and boys and women are 40 percent more likely than men to develop mental illness in general 
the biological differences between men and women are often overlooked to support the equality narrative. It's like comparing apples to oranges. It's often when stress levels are high that all the social graces fall away. Uh, and it's also when tempers fray. They've got to learn quickly how to communicate better as a team. <laughs> Reality shows like Survivor demonstrate time and time again that when women and men are operating in separate camps, the men's camp is orderly, structured, and cooperative. Whereas the women's camp struggles with basic tasks, argue amongst themselves, and lack harmony. If only man would stop for one moment in his heedless rush toward progress and think about this state of affairs, he would inevitably realize that his efforts to give woman a sense of mental stimulation have been totally in vain. It is true that woman gets progressively more elegant, more well-groomed, more cultured, but her demands on life will always be material, never intellectual. Villar's harsh descriptions of women sound shocking if you were raised to view women from a romantic perspective and believe that women are oppressed by men. This romantic perspective is essential because it's hard for men to love and care for women when they understand them, when they see women for what they truly are. The truth is women naturally look for status, wealth and power. That's where their loyalty lies. There is new research that shows half of all women have a guy on the back burner just in case things go wrong in their current relationship. Dr. Romy, seriously? Good morning, Tom. I know. And I come on. Like this sounds positively guy. It sounds positively guy, guy, guy. In modern times, the truth about female nature is clear as daylight. We're living in the age of information. Statistics and data are collected daily, and women expose themselves on social media, proving their materialistic and hypergamous nature. The discourse around modern women's oppression often highlights the lack of female representation in high-profile positions like CEOs, as depicted in the Barbie movie. However, there is little focus on the lower-ranking but essential jobs that keep society functioning such as construction, sanitation, and manual labor, which are predominantly held by men and typically less desired by women. Furthermore, the outcry about gender inequality tends to surface primarily when women are perceived as being disadvantaged. For instance, we only seem to hear crickets when it comes to the discussion about men being restricted from leaving the country due to the war in Ukraine. The selective outrage overlooks the broader spectrum of gender-related issues, particularly those that disproportionately affect men. If women really felt oppressed by men, they would have developed hate and fear for them, as the oppressed always do. But women do not fear men, much less hate them. If they really felt humiliated by men's mental superiority, they would have used every means in their power to change the situation. If women really felt unfree, surely, at such a favorable time in their history, they would have broken free of their oppressors. Bingo. I've said this time and again, pay attention. Women will just reveal themselves. They will just look. What are they saying? We hate men. Man, men oppress us. And then they're like, why won't they date me? Where have all the good guys gone? Where are they? How come men don't approach me? Blah, blah, blah. And you're like, and I know I've heard, I've heard you guys say that, like you would choose a bear over me. What are you talking about? Exactly. If it were true, if it were true at all, this whole uh, lie that men are the oppressors, that women are afraid of them, blah, blah, blah. If that were true, Women wouldn't be trying to, you know, get a man all the time. They wouldn't be dressing half naked to get their attention. They wouldn't be doing that. But they are, so somebody's not telling the truth. <laughs> this foolishness is mirrored in the Barbie movie. Barbie chooses to become a human being in the real world instead of staying in the perfect utopia of Barbie land. 
In the real world, the first thing Barbie does is get a vagina. This proves Villar right. Women do not feel oppressed. It's the problem that has no name by Betty Friedan. Women want to have that cake and eat it too. They want to do whatever they feel. And that's not how the real world works. Sounds like a child. I want to eat candy for dinner. How come I can't have ice cream? How come we can't go to Disney every day? You can't let the children make the decisions. I'll just say that. Which is driving them nuts. That's why women's happiness has been on a steady decline for over 60 years. The more freedom women get, the more responsibilities they must take on. The more choices women have, the harder it is to make a decision. The paradox of choice is making them miserable. Yeah. It's interesting to see that it's men who are now the ones who are walking away. They are not giving up. They just found another purpose that is worth their time, money, and energy. That's what the art of walking away is all about. As the Villar says, a man is always searching for someone or something to enslave him. For only as a slave does he feel secure. And as a rule, his choice falls on a woman. You no longer have to be a slave to women, guys. Instead, men now have the freedom to choose how they want to live their lives. Engaging with women or prioritizing oneself is a choice, not a necessity. Walking away is not about giving up or being bitter. It's about doing what's best for you and finding happiness on your terms. This life has many, 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 many beautiful things to offer. From pursuing passions and hobbies to traveling the world, and building meaningful relationships based on mutual respect and understanding. Embrace your journey and remember that your happiness and well-being are paramount. Patreon supporters, salute! Man, I we work here. Protect yourself at all times. This video has officially been highlighted. The link to the video will be in the description. Wow. Yeah, Esther Vilar what a what a hero you guys are right yes i do need to read her book she is absolutely spot on you know when she said that a man is going to be enslaved to something i obviously i don't like that take on it i have to think more about that and get more context as to what she's talking about but if if that okay let's just let's just for the point of argument and for a thought experiment, let's take that as just truth. If a man has, uh, if a man, if a man is going to choose to enslave himself and he has chosen a woman, let's just say for argument's sake that that's true. And let's say for argument's sake that's unchangeable. That is a tremendous responsibility on the woman. That man is entrusting that to you. You have the responsibility not to take advantage of that. Same as he has a responsibility to not take advantage of the fact that we are weaker. You know, he's not going to force himself and what have you. He's going to be gentle. You know, there's that sort of beautiful complementary nature that we that we have towards each other. And so if there's a situation where the man is, you know, he's sort of compelled to be a slave to something and it has to be the woman. You you have to. You have to guard that as the woman. And. Always be grateful and appreciative of all the all the stuff that he does and try your best to you know be worthy of it and to give back in every way that you possibly can and to let him know that whatever his deepest darkest fears are what cuz he's going to have them whatever his deep, deepest, darkest fears are, whatever those thoughts are that plague his mind that he can't tell anybody about, 
when he shares that with you, he has to know you don't think any less of him. You know he is still the strong, capable, intelligent man that you have chosen. None of that makes a difference. None of that lessens that at all. And you have to protect those fears, those insecurities, those doubts that he has. Protect them by never sharing them, not even back to him. Because that is not, that is not what you've been entrusted with. But women just take this role and use everything, use every weakness as another uh, tool in their manipulation to gain control and extract resources, et cetera, et cetera. And nobody's, nobody's any better for it. That's ridic That's the ridiculous thing. All these freedoms and opportunities and everything that the women have, what they're doing with them isn't helping them. It isn't helping men, and that's for sure. Sure isn't helping the children. Nobody is better off. Nobody. And when they, you know, men were just a cog in the machine and still are anybody who works, pays taxes and all that stuff, you're just a cog in the machine. And when they said, oh, women, you got to get to work too. All they did was cut wages. So not only were men still slave in the machine, now some women were too. And now everybody gets half the pay. Oh, wow. Wow. I'm so excited. He's going to have at least a couple more of these videos, but I still need to read the book. I don't need to cheat and just rely on these excellent videos, but it has been quite the teaser. It, I guess this book will be next after Rachel Wilson's book. So it'll be a steady, steady uh, stream of books. I'm not one of those people that can read two books at once. I have to focus on the one. Wow. Well, what do you guys think? Have you read Esther Bilar's book? Do you think it's correct? And what do you think about traditionalism? Because I, I see the argument of the whole chivalry thing and how it's not good. It's just uh, another way for men to serve and women to receive. And that is not what femininity is about. But, uh, anyways, oh wow, that was a lot to think about. I love you guys. I appreciate you. I hope you've protected your peace today. And I hope that you found something to feed your soul. And I will see you guys on the next one.